Hello, this is an Amtel operator calling from Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center with a prepaid collect call from Alec. To accept this prepaid collect call, press 1. All phone calls are subject to monitoring and recording. Thank you for using Amtel. I don't know what we expected Alec Murdoch's jailhouse phone calls to be like. But after listening to them, we are more certain than ever of Alec's extraordinary ability to manipulate and control those around him, even his own family. My name is Mandy Matney. I've been investigating the Murdoch family for three years now. This is the Murdoch Murders Podcast with David Moses and Liz Farrell. This week marks the third anniversary of Mallory Beach's death. Our hearts are with the Beach family, as well as Mallory's friends and everyone who loves and misses her. We are thinking of Morgan, Miley, Connor, and Anthony, who have to relive the worst nights of their lives in the national spotlight over and over again, through no fault of their own. It's important to recognize that none of the victims or their family asked to be in this international news story. We wish all of the victims and their families peace this week and ask anyone who would like to honor Mallory to do so by donating to her charity, Mal's Pals at malspals.com. That's M-A-L-S-P-A-L-Z.com. All funds go directly to building a new shelter in Hampton County and support local shelters because Mallory loved animals. This week, David, Liz, and I spent hours listening to recordings of some of the phone calls Alec Murdoch has made to family members since his arrest in October. In January, we filed a Freedom of Information Act request for a number of phone calls that Alec had made from the Richland County Detention Center. Between his arrest last fall and December 9th, Alec made almost 100 phone calls, most of them to his son Buster, his brothers Randy and John Marvin, his sister Lynn, and his sister-in-law Liz. These phone calls have given us a lot of insight into the Murdoch family dynamic and a closer look at Alec's sociopathy, which is beyond anything we could have imagined. The calls were mostly short because inmates at the Richland County Jail are limited to 15 minutes per call. The first phone call is from October 24th, 2021, which is 10 days after SLED arrested Alec while he was in Orlando, Florida on charges related to the Gloria Satterfield settlement. Remember, he was arrested after allegedly completing more than 30 days of rehab following his so-called suicide for hire incident on September 4th. In this call, Alec is speaking to his 25-year-old son, Buster, who is on Hilton Head Island with his girlfriend, Brooklyn, just after he got home from a trip to Las Vegas with his uncle, John Marvin. You probably remember this trip because a photo of Buster gambling was circulated online, which Buster references in this phone call. It's that photo that led victims' attorneys to file an emergency request with the court to freeze Alec and Buster's assets and assign a receiver to comb through their finances. I have no huh? idea. Hello? Hey. Yeah. Hey. <clears throat> I have no idea what? Um, I was talking to Brooklyn. Hey, when did y'all get to tell, tell Brooklyn, detail Brooklyn, congratulations? Yeah, I did. Is, can I speak to her? Yeah, you can speak to her. Hello. Hey, darling. Hi. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Were you excited to find out? Yes, sir. I was. When exactly did you relief. find out? Buster said it was when y'all were in the mountains. And I wasn't trying to bother y'all up there because I knew you didn't have service. 
Um, it that was last Friday, so the October fifteenth. Did you know you were gonna find out then? Yes, I did. So you knew you were gonna know when you were going up to the mountains. Yeah, they told us on um Wednesday, I believe, that the scores were getting released on that Friday at four. So well, yeah, you, I knew whenever we were going up there. You weren't really worried, were you? Oh, I was a nervous wreck. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember. I remember so clearly. Well, I'm so proud of you. Well, thank you. I know y'all are tired. I know you haven't seen Buster, so I'm not going to keep y'all but a second. I just want to make sure he made it home okay. Oh, yeah, and here, you can talk to him. All right, I miss you. I miss you, too, and I love you. Love you. Brooklyn, who has dated Buster since 2019, just passed the bar exam, and Ellick is congratulating her. You'll notice throughout these phone calls that being a lawyer is something Ellick Murdoch absolutely values and identifies with. And later, you'll see that he seems fixated on Buster getting back into law school. According to our sources, Buster was asked to leave USC's School of Law after a cheating scandal. It is clear from this phone call that Ellick considers himself to be close with Brooklyn, who offered an unsolicited I love you before quickly hopping off the phone and handing it back to Buster. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey. What time did y'all get back? Um... Back to where? Home. Uh, like 5 o'clock this morning. How'd y'all get back at 5 o'clock this morning if y'all left at 10.53 out there? With Time change. Yeah, I know, but it's 10.53 out there y'all left, right? No, we left at 9.30. At uh, 9.30 out there. So we left at 9.30. It's a, it's a, it's a four-hour flight, so you really land at, you know, around 1.00. And then you traveled through three time zones, which adds three hours. So we landed at about 4.30. 10 four. Dang, y'all had to be tired. Um, yeah, I am tired. I am, well, <clears throat> it was easier for me because they dropped me off in my car, which was in Columbia, and I just went to my apartment and slept for you several hours. In Columbia? Where did y'all fly into? Charlotte. Why'd y'all do that? Um, you know, it's just that that was where the... the cheapest flight was. What'd y'all fly on? Uh, Spirit Airlines. How was that? It was better than I expected it to be. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I mean, I thought, <clears throat> I don't know, I just, you know, it was, it was better than, you know, I just thought it was a real cheap airline, but I mean, it was nicer than I thought it was going to be. Did y'all have room in your seat? You know, the seats are all right, they, but, you know, it was, you know, it's it's a totally, it's just a different, like, the seats don't recline because they can sit more if they don't recline, it's just, you know, it's just different. So you went four hours with no recline? I'm sure you guys noticed Alex's knowing little laugh at Buster's Economy Airlines experience. Sources have always told us that the Murdochs weren't extravagant people, but we do know that they tended to fly private. Alec obviously thinks it's adorable that his heinous crimes have led to his adult son having to slum it. But yeah, I mean, they're all, everyone's fine. Everyone was fine. So was it a good trip or, you know, just sort of okay? No, it was a good trip. It was. You know, it's, 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 it's different going to Vegas with, with young children, um, but... You know, everything was still fun, and then going to Sedona was did a good get, time. Did you get to gamble any? Yeah, yeah, so I did go gambling, and then the next day there was an article created about how I'm misusing funds. By gambling? Yeah, someone took a picture of me and John Marvin in the casino. You're kidding me. Uh-uh. What a fucking... You Are you kidding me? No. How do they recognize no. you? Man, I guess, but, I mean, I'm a national figure, I think. I guess you're going to have to wear a hat and shit when you go places. 
So four days before this call, our founding editor Will Folks of Fitz News published an exclusive report about Buster and John Marvin's trip to Las Vegas. Less than a day after Alec's bond hearing in Richland County, when Judge Clifton Newman denied Alec Bond, John Marvin and Buster were spotted at a blackjack table at the Venetian. It was relevant because at the time, Buster had just been granted power of attorney over his father's assets. Also notice, Ellick never apologizes to his son, who is obviously under national media scrutiny because of him. He just tells him to wear a hat while he's in public, which isn't very helpful. Now, I want you to pay attention to the next part. In all of these calls, we notice a pattern with Ellick. After he warms up the person he's talking to, he'll start to end the call, but strategically uses the wind down moment to ask his family members to do things for him, right before it's hang up time. The other day, a man who knew the Murdoch family for decades told me that Alec had a real talent for getting people to do things for him, which explains how he was able to get away with what he did for so many years. Anyway, this part coming up, I want you to listen carefully. Um, where are you gonna be tomorrow? Um, here, be here. Hey, please stay on John Marvin's ass to see about that stuff from Mark Ball and any of those other funds to put on that thing. Being taken care of in the morning. So Mark's gonna do it? Yep, they're writing the check in the morning. The check will be ready at 8.30. John sends someone to pick it up and then simultaneously running it over to Palmetto State to apply it. And I'm driving to Charleston in the morning to pick up the check for the boat. They gonna apply that too? Correct. I mean, I don't see how they fuss when everything's being applied to the bank. Yeah, I mean, ten four. So all that'll be done. All that'll be done by lunch tomorrow. That makes me feel better. So it'll be three fifty. How much has been put on it so far? Um, Dad, I I don't have an exact figure. Um, you know, a couple couple tens of thousands maybe. You know, just selling pieces of equipment. Alright. Well, I love you and um. Well, this call turned out to be a real who's who of Alec's money-moving shenanigans. First, you remember our friend Mark Ball, right? He was directly involved in the old jellyfish gambit, and he was also Alec's colleague at PMPED. Seems like, just a few days after attorneys called for Alec's finances to be frozen and handed over to a receivership, that Mark Ball was cutting Alec a check. This check was so critical to Alec that Buster is told to stay on John Marvin about it. But he doesn't have to do that because John Marvin has already arranged for somebody to go get the check and run it over to Palmetto State Bank to apply it to something. We don't know what it is, but anyone who knows simple math is aware that Mark Ball plus Palmetto State Bank plus a quickly cut check divided by Alec equals I hope Sled is listening to this. Anyway, Buster asks his dad about his court proceedings. Before they end the phone call, Alec and Buster chat about sports scores, and we get why that's so important to him in a later phone call. We'll be right back. Now, November was another really bad month for Alec Murdoch. As a reminder, on November 2nd, Judge Daniel Hall froze Alec and Buster Murdoch's assets. On November 10th, Judge Clifton Newman denied Alec Murdoch's bond for the second time. On November 19th, Alec was indicted on 27 counts of financial crimes, including fraud and money laundering. The next call happened on November 30th, the week after Thanksgiving. Alec Murdoch called Buster, who just got back from a fishing trip somewhere off the coast of South Carolina. The two start with a little routine father-son talk. Hey, bud. Hey. What are you doing? Nothing. I'm in Brooklyn's uh, condo. I get one in a minute. Oh, yeah? You yeah. stayed there last night? I did. Well, good. How's she doing? She's good. Did she have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Well, good. Tell me about the fishing trip. Um, it was good. How many did y'all catch? Caught, caught a sailfish and a couple tuna. Black fin? Yeah. No wahoo? No, no wahoo. But, I mean, when you're fishing on a boat like that, it don't, I mean, even if you ain't catching nothing, you, you, you're doing pretty good, ain't you? 
They go back and forth about the fishing trip for a few. Buster seems a little short with his father and starts to sound annoyed as Alec turns the conversation to Buster making arrangements to re-enroll in law school in January. Hey, Buff, not trying to bug you, babe, but you got to get that thing reset with law school. Um, I sent I sent an email to Hubbard this morning. Okay. All right. Well, good deal. Um, everything else okay? Yeah. What have you been doing? I haven't talked to you since Thursday. Uh, no, well, no, you talked to me Friday. I did? Yeah, I thought you did when you got back to... No, 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 that's right, because it was Thursday afternoon. We were on lockdown Friday. Alec then starts asking Buster about his financial situation. This call is one that later gets referenced by Prosecutor Creighton Waters during Ellick's bond reconsideration hearing as evidence that Ellick hasn't stopped his financial shuffling behind bars. I told John to give you money until I get everything sorted out where I'm paying back. Some for. Has he? Um, yeah, but I mean, I haven't really needed any money. Yeah, but you gotta pay rent now. Um, well, the one time, one time I paid rent, maybe tomorrow though, so I can ask him for money. Say that again. Say that again. One time you paid rent and what? Or, I mean, one time I paid rent that was out of my account, but I have to pay it again tomorrow so I can ask him for money tomorrow. Do you feel uncomfortable asking him? No, it's not uncomfortable. It's just, I mean, it's not very fair to him. Well, but I mean, I'm, he, I, I've got him keeping up with all of it so I can pay him back. No, I understand. You don't worry about that. I mean, I've even asked him if he wanted me to do other things because there's other options, and he's absolutely, I mean, he's absolutely said, I mean, I've talked to him at length about this, so he said he's glad to do it, so don't be bashful. Now here, Alec is telling his son Buster to go to John Marvin, Alec's brother and Buster's uncle, to ask for money. Mind you, Buster is 25 years old with a full-time job at Wild Wing Cafe corporate offices as a recruiter. Notice that Alec is not acting like he is impecunious, as his attorneys have said, but rather he insists that there is money there and he has quote-unquote options, whatever those were. Okay. And Buster, you need to get ready for this law school now, okay? I understand. I mean, you got to really buckle down, and you got to—I mean, you got to treat it like a job. You're gonna have to read these cases two and three times if you don't fully understand them. I mean, you're gonna have to treat it like a job. I understand. You promise? Yes. Because you know there's not gonna be another chance. I know. I mean, no way is no way, shape, or form is there gonna be another chance. I understand. You do truly understand that? Yes. All right. All right, so you going to be on the road this afternoon? Yes. Yeah, the road this uh, afternoon. Hopefully I'm going to be able to call again. I got to, hopefully Jim's supposed to come by and meet with him. I'm trying to get the finances straight with them, and then I got to talk to John and see um, whether we're going to do a loan, and then I'm going to pay it back out of an account later. Or we're going to have a letter from a, a, an opinion from a lawyer who does retirement accounts that rolling it over. Because, I mean, if you pay interest on something for, let's see, six years, it could end up being more than the penalty. But we got to make sure the penalty doesn't open it up to creditors. Because, I mean, you're going to need that money. If there ever truly was a question about whether or not Dick and Jim were getting paid for representing Alec in this mess, there is your answer. And then, at the end of the conversation, Alec again asked Buster to do something for him. All right, well, please tell Brooklyn hello. Okay. Did you by chance talk to Grandma or Papa T? Um, I did mention it to him, and I told him that I never really got a private moment with them. I didn't want to keep talking about it in front of people, but I did mention it to them, and they said that they were that they would like to do it, but they were concerned that they wouldn't be able to figure it out via the phone. Well, and if I you think they really it. don't, if you think they really would rather wait until I get out, it ain't gonna hurt my feelings. I understand. Okay. What's your opinion? No, I don't have an opinion. I I, I tried to talk to him about it, but we were always around the entire family, and I didn't. Really you tried what just, now? So I tried to talk to him about it, but we were never, we were never not around the entire group of the family. So I didn't really feel like talking about it in front of everybody. I understand. 
So we're not entirely sure what this is about, but it seems sketchy. It seems like Alec is asking Buster whether he has spoken with Grandma and Papa T, who we're told are Maggie's parents. Buster seems uncomfortable. Clearly, whatever Alec wanted him to ask them about is something Buster doesn't want to bring up in front of other family members. Since Alec's entire world seems to be about money, it would not be a stretch to think that he might be instructing Buster to talk to his other grandparents about finances. The next day, on Wednesday, December 1st, Alec called Buster again. Alec starts by bragging about winning jail bets on NFL games. Hey, what you doing? Uh, nothing. I'm in bed in Charlotte. Am I waking you up? No, it's not. It's only nine o'clock. What? It's nine o'clock. Yeah. Hey, I hit nine out of eleven games on um Sunday on the pro games. Well, I missed good. the Eagles and I missed the Steelers. The Eagles were three and a half point favorites over the Giants and they lost. And the Steelers were four and a half point underdogs to the Bengals and they lost by twenty. But I hit nine out of eleven. That's pretty damn hard. Yeah. I won like six suits, four B sticks, a uh, bunch of crackers, and cook you know, a bunch of canteen shit. Well, that's good. There was like thirteen of us playing. Everybody put in something, you know. Right. I won thirteen things. So, anyway, how you doing? Obviously, Alec appears to be hustling in jail. Maybe he's bored. Maybe his real addiction is just breaking the rules. Whatever it is, he sure was proud about those beef sticks. Alec then asked Buster if he's talked to his attorney, Jim Griffin, about his habeas corpus petition that was filed on November 10th after Judge Newman denied Alec Bond for a second time. Note that Alec sounds like he's just learned a new fun fact about the law. Jim, have you talked to Jim lately? Um, I haven't. John Marvin talked to Jim today. Did he tell you about um, them expediting this thing? Expediting what? This appeal. It's, it's called habeas corpus. Then it deals with a constitutional issue. You have a constitutional right to bail for any non-capital offense. And so when he denied bond, they, they filed a habeas corpus petition, and the Supreme Court first said they weren't going to expedite it, then they wrote back and gave the Attorney General 10 days to respond. You would assume, or at least the lawyers assume, that if they weren't going to do something, they would just let it sit. But, I, I mean, I don't get my hopes up, you know, but they seem to be have their hopes up. I hear you. It would seem that Dick and Jim did get Alex's hopes up over nothing. Spoiler alert. The Supreme Court denied the writ of habeas corpus in January after Judge Lee set Alex Bond at $7 million. It is interesting to note that Dick and Jim thought they had a shot with the Supreme Court, and it makes you wonder why they had that assurance. Anyways, on a phone call, Buster then tells Alec that John Marvin is trying to get his guns back from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED. What, what, else, did, what else did he tell John? Um, well, I, he, John said that he was going to talk to me about something, but said he, he'd rather talk to me about it in person. That's probably what it was. Um, no, nah, that wouldn't be it. That wouldn't make sense. Why he want to talk to you about that in person? Um, but uh, mostly, I, 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 I've had John calling David Owens every day um, to try to get my guns back. And prior to Thanksgiving, David Owens said that we could have them back. And then today he said he couldn't have them back. So that's what John was calling to tell me, and then he called and told Jim what David Owens said about not being able to get him. I wonder why. Uh, John said that he used the, the language out of an abundance of caution, and then John said, well, have you not run the ballistics on him? And apparently he was like, no, we have. And he was like, well, were these guns used in the crowd? And they were like, no. And I was like, and he was like, well, why can't we have them back? So I don't know. I'm just, I've just been trying to get, get some of my stuff back. From this conversation, it sounds like Alec is trying to sell off expensive tools and machinery so that the victims can't claim them as assets. In October, Alec's brother Randy filed a lawsuit claiming that Alec owed him $90,000 and wrote in the suit that he had been paid back in part by equipment that Buster had signed over to him. Hey, um, John Marvin needs to go. You know that vacuum packer that John Marvin lent us to send the skin and shed? No, that, that huge one? Yeah, 
he needs to go so pick that up. Okay. He, he, for before they, you know, take it like, think it's mine. Yeah. Fall apart. And there's a bunch of John Marvin's tools in the shop. I told him he needs to get out. All right. Those, all those Milwaukee tools, all those jacks, all that stuff. Yeah. Hard, and I borrowed a lot of it, too. Yeah, we're going to go, um, we're going to be down in Greenfield this weekend, Clark Coyle, and he talked about going over to Green, or going over to Green, like, going over to Moselle and getting some of that stuff. Then, Alex starts asking questions about Blanca. According to sources, Blanca was Maggie's housekeeper at the Edisto Beach House, where Maggie was staying by herself before the murders. Next time you're on the phone. I'll have a pen and paper. Did you call Blanca for me? No, I still haven't called Blanca. I keep forgetting to call Blanca. Okay, do you want me to get somebody else to do it? No, I mean, I'm fine to do it. It's just, I don't know. For some reason, I keep forgetting. Okay, well, are you going to remember for me? Because I'd like to call her soon. And I don't mind getting somebody else to do it. I know you got a lot going on. No, I mean, do you, do you have Blanca's number? No, that's what I said. I, I told you I got to get her number, and I wanted you to let her know. I'm going to be calling and make sure that she's good with that, number one. And number two, kind of tell her what she's got to do. 10 to Okay, well, yeah, I'll, um, I'll reach will out. Will you please do that in the morning? Yes. And will you please tell her that I'd ask you to do it before Thanksgiving and you just had a lot going on and forgot? Yep. You you promise? I promise I'm going to try, though. All right. I just so, yeah, I feel confident it, that I should remember the morning. I know you had said you didn't really want to, I mean... She had irritated you, and if you don't want to call her, I promise you I'll get Lizzie or Grandma or somebody else. So we don't know what's going on here, but Alex seems really determined to get a hold of Blanca. From our sources, we know that Alex seeks to control the narrative, and he puts himself square in the face of people he's trying to persuade or even just monitor. Before he was in jail, Alec was known for having sit-down talks with people who might have a reason to be upset with him or his family. These sit-downs, according to my sources, were a classic manipulation tactic that Alec frequently used. Alec then changes the subject to apparently one of his favorite topics, Buster's future in law school. Did you get back from the day? No, no, I was checking my email all day today, I emailed him beginning of this week and I haven't I haven't heard back. I, I emailed him and I and I Hold on. You did what? I emailed him and I CC'd the associate dean and I haven't heard heard back yet. Okay, if you don't hear today, this is Monday, you did it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, tomorrow you might just shoot a follow up. Yeah, I mean I'm if I don't hear from I'll definitely shoot the follow up later this week. Tomorrow? And um, and if I don't hear if I don't hear from him I might get in touch with Butch to see if you can if you can call him and say that I've been trying to get in touch with him. Alright. Is Butch paid all the money that he was owed? Yes. Okay. Up front and he it, he it was up front and it was it was thirty grand up front and thirty. I know with he a was contingency on if it was successful. I'm just making sure I don't want to call him if he got have the shit he has. It was straight to have. Nah, he 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 knows he's totally paid. I mean, would he be willing to do something like that? You think? Absolutely. But I would do it yourself first. I'd just say, hey, just following up, um, you know, the holiday. No, I will be But, I mean, if you got, if you got answered by the back end of this week and we get into the middle of next week, then something's got to be done for me to reach. That's what I'm saying. When do classes start? January the 5th. 5th? Yeah, yeah. that's why. I, really, you need to send it tomorrow. And if you haven't heard from him by Friday, um, and I'd say something real nice. Just like, hey, just following up on my email. I know... This is a busy time of year, but was hoping we could meet soon, just like that. Just or, or yeah. we could get a meeting set soon, yeah, or, or a reset soon, is what I'd say. And then say, just say thank you for your attention. Ten four. Something real nice like that. But you you ought to send it to Mar to give him a chance to respond to you Friday. This conversation reveals something disturbing that we are looking into. Alec and Buster refer to Butch, who we've been told is Butch Bowers, a highly influential Columbia attorney from Hampton County. 
Butch has represented our state's governors, including Henry McMaster, and State Senator Lindsey Graham recommended him to be a member of President Trump's impeachment team. He is incredibly connected to the University of South Carolina. Another fun fact about Butch, his father and namesake, Carl S. Bauer Sr., was an ex-con. He was federally indicted in 1980 on 15 counts related to the fraudulent sale of homes in Hampton County. He was found guilty of tax evasion and served time in prison. Then, the good old boys named a bridge after him. Not just a bridge, but one of the bridges to one of the state's most important sources of tourist revenue, Hilton Head Island. Butch's father was also awarded the Order of the Palmetto, which is supposed to be the state's most prestigious award. You might remember that Alec's father was also awarded the Order of the Palmetto. If you haven't noticed it by now, good old boys really like to give trophies to other good old boys. Anyway, it seems like Alec has paid Butch Bowers $60,000 to do something in connection with Buster's readmittance to law school, but it's not clear what. Alec encourages Buster to write an email to Dean Hubbard, who is William Hubbard. William Hubbard is a former colleague of Bowers at the politically powerful Nelson Mullins Riley Scarborough law firm. Call Butch. Um, I call him late Friday afternoon, and um, okay. that way he can be prepared to call them first thing Monday morning. Good for. Are you willing to do that? Yeah, I'm the one that came up with the idea on this telephone call. Buster, there's so many things I got to tell y'all when I get out of here. Lord have mercy. This is something else. But anyway, I love you. Alright, love you too. I hope you know how proud of you I am. Yes, sir. You hear me? I do. Alright, old boy. Talk to you soon. Alright, bye. Love you more. Bye. This is the only time in these calls that we got that Alec says that he's proud of Buster. And it appears to be while they're talking about some shady money shuffling in order to get him back into law school. We'll be right back. On the same day, December 1st, Alec called his brother John Marvin. John Marvin reminds Alec that he is cautious about talking over the phone with Buster, which indicates to us that he's wary of his phone being tapped for some reason. Uh, no, no, everything's good. You know, I just, when we start talking about things over the phone, it always bothers me because I don't know if this is on this phone or not. Uh, especially this phone, so remember that. Then Alec gets a little cryptic. He mentions a financial situation involving Jim and Dick, his attorneys, as well as a mysterious letter. I've got to get this finance stuff straight with Jim and Dick. Um, okay. I put some thought into it, and I want you to have, will you have that letter with you tomorrow when I call you? No, but I'll see if I can dig it out. That, that letter really was nothing more than saying that, that that they had received a request to didn't to to look into it. It didn't say that it was being moved. It didn't say anything along those lines. But I'll try to find that letter. Find that and, and try to read it to me. And I'm gonna talk to you about this other stuff. And let's figure out. Um, I mean, I think I about figured it out. But let's figure out what to do because I'm I'm not gonna be able to talk but about another minute. After getting off the phone with John Marvin on December first. Alec called their older brother, Randy Murdoch. Now remember, Randy, who is also an attorney at the firm, is currently suing Alec for $90,000 of alleged unpaid debt. We say alleged because this lawsuit was seen as a scheme to help Alec retain his assets and keep them away from victims. On this phone call, the two brothers do not act like one of them just sued the other for unpaid money. They are downright chummy with each other. Also, Alec talks about another of his favorite jail phone topics, his workouts. I'll tell you what I've started doing. You'd be proud of me. I really started exercising pretty dang Good, hard. Huh? I mean, like, I mean, I was like almost two hours and 40 minutes today just because we were shut in the room this morning. But, I mean, I've been like an hour and 15 or 20 minutes a day. Hey, but that's well, good. That's very this good. Is not, this is the start of my... I started on Friday the 12th. And, I mean, right. I can tell a distinct difference 
already. You know, man, I had not exercised in 25 years. Yeah, but hey, Mo, me either, actually. And, you know? I mean, and, and both laying around in rehab and then really from the, so for 38 days I did very little. The last, right. about, the last about seven, I was up a lot more, but I still wasn't doing anything strenuous. So that right, was a month right. and a week. And then when I came in here, I obviously thought I was getting out on the 19th, so I didn't do anything. And then I thought I was getting out shortly after that with Donna Maddox, you know. So I didn't do anything for about two and a half weeks in here. Right. Really, it's longer than that. I, and then I started doing a few push-ups. But for some reason, it made my head hurt after about a few days. But now it's not doing that. I guess I've gotten, you told me better, that. I've gotten in better shape. Alec tells Randy he's been hearing a high-pitched ringing noise in his ears and wonders whether it's a side effect of his alleged drug addiction. I would think it's more to do with your hereditary and your shooting, you know? Alec is clearly optimistic about getting out of jail soon. Here he sounds very hopeful about Dick and Jim's habeas corpus motion. But also, quite appallingly, he makes it a point to say that he didn't know what a habeas corpus was before now. Apparently neither did Randy. Both of these men have been attorneys for decades. But okay. You're never too old to learn something new. Hey, maybe we're teaching them about the Freedom of Information Act today. Hey, bud, have, you talked to, have you talked to Jim and Dick or whomever else about filing bankruptcy, bro? Um, yeah, I mean, we've discussed it, but there's some time and... I mean, it's almost what? like you're stuck in bankruptcy right now, but you got all the bad from it, but none of the good from it. You know what I'm saying? So they're talking about... I'm not really familiar with this, but apparently... There's a civil writ. What is it? I've heard of the writ of mandamus, but I don't really know what it is. But it must be something that gives you quick turnaround. Right. When it's you something got immediate harm. The Supreme Court. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. that's what they're going to do. If but you know he's going to deny it, and he's going to do it. But they at least told me Dick came to see me yesterday and told me that the Supreme Court. You know, they filed a. I've, I've heard of this too, but I didn't know what it is. You know what a habeas corpus writ, a writ of habeas corpus is? I know it's something directly to the Supreme Court, but I, other than that, no, I don't know. So apparently, apparently, you know, there's nobody with this kind of stuff that that has ever not gotten a bond. It might be a, you know, a huge bond, but they get a bond, and you're constitutionally entitled to a bond for non-capital offenses, is what they tell me. Constitutionally right. entitled. And because it's a constitutional violation, you can file a writ of habeas corpus. Same thing like a right. writ of mandamus for a civil charge, habeas corpus is for a criminal charge. I think they're the same thing, just one's criminal and one's civil. And I got anyway, they initially said they weren't going to expedite it, but then they said they are going to expedite it, and they gave the Attorney General 10 days to respond. I don't get my hopes up about anything, because I, I, you know, I don't think normal rules apply to me right now, but they seem to think that if the Supreme Court wasn't going to do something, that they wouldn't have done that. So they're at least optimistic they're going to do something. Right. I mean, the Attorney General only asked for a $200,000 bond, you know. I mean, they could give me, you know, a $20 million bond but and, and comply with the Constitution. But I'm being facetious. I, I think it's got to be, you know, reasonable, but they could say $5 million. You wouldn't think, that, you wouldn't think a judge would say more than what the, what the Attorney General asked for, you know. Well, he said no bond. I thought he said 200000 That's what the Attorney General asked for. Clifton Newman wouldn't give me a bond. That's yeah, I know, but that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You wouldn't think he would require more bond than Solicitor asked for. Yeah. So anyway, they're trying to take it out of, I don't know. They seem very optimistic.
Two days after this conversation, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court effectively removed Judge Newman from making any more decisions about Ellick's bond. In the days that followed that decision, Fitznews kept asking our sources whether Judge Newman's no-bond ruling would still be in effect. We were assured again and again that it would. Later, we found out that the two charges were basically replaced by the state grand jury indictments and that Judge Lee, who was famously known for her lenient bond setting, was now on the case. So yeah, Dick and Jim were optimistic on December 1st. So we'll see. It would be nice to get out for a little while and then go deal with this stuff, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bob, I know... I know. I, I look at it as every day I'm in here now is one less day I'm in here in the long run, you know? Well, you know what? That's, that's, that is the fact. I mean, the fact is, every time there's a new, you know, a new case that comes up, a new, you know, revelation of, you know, something you took, Bo, those, those same people very, very quickly are going to the, um, they're re- being subpoenaed to the state grand jury. So, I mean, it's just, you know, there's going to be more to come. Obviously, you know that. Right. And so, you know, you're right about that. Just, I mean, but the quicker that it all can come to a head, the better, obviously, I think. I think so, too. So. We have to ask, how does Randy Murdoch know who has been subpoenaed to testify in front of the super secretive state grand jury? Seems like a real breach of trust and potentially dangerous for witnesses who are just trying to speak their truth. The next call Ellick made that night was to his sister, Lynn. She is the oldest Murdoch sibling and doesn't seem nearly as involved in the family affairs as her brothers. Lynn asked about Ellick's day-to-day life in jail. And of course, he talks about working out a lot. I'm, I'm with a small group for the most part. You know, 70%, 75% of the time, I'm with these same five guys. And then there's... Yeah. There's another guy that's on our thing, but he he doesn't even come out when he's just kind of weird. He doesn't come out. But anyway, you know, I mean, we play chess and play cards, and we have. Well, at least you got got somebody to interact with a little bit now. I was yeah. worried about you when you were completely by yourself. Uh, and I tell you this, I've been really exercising that's right. hard. Once I made it, once I. I didn't do crap while I thought I was getting out quickly. And then, you know, yeah. and I mean, I can really tell the difference. Like today, yeah. we didn't we didn't get out. They had people working in here, so they wouldn't let us out mm-hmm. early. I mean, I, I exercised for two hours and 40 minutes. I'm telling you, mm. I, can, I can tell the difference, too. He says that Lynn and his sister-in-law, Lizzie, wrote him more than anyone else. I'm, I'm trying to make the best out of it. I'm really trying to yeah. exercise hard and, um, you know, yeah. I, 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 truly, I quit. It, it bugged the shit out of me to start with, but I started looking at it as, you know what? Every day I do now is one less day. One less you have to do on the tail end of it. You are absolutely right. And just gotta keep that attitude, but, um, it, I know it's tough. I can't imagine. Can't imagine. And we'll be right back. Next up are calls from January 4th. These calls were also brought up by Prosecutor Creighton Waters during Ellick's bond reconsideration hearing on January 10th. In that hearing, Creighton was making it clear that even from behind bars, Ellick was exploiting the rules for his own benefit. First up, Ellick asked Buster about his money situation. Buster, how are you doing on finances? Um, pretty slim. But it'll be getting better. Well, listen here. Um, do you want me to tell Uncle John to give you, you know, several thousand dollars, and then I'll pay no. him back? No, it's just I've, I've just had expenses like considering I had to change my, um, I had to change my medical insurance. Buster keeps telling his dad that he is financially fine, but his dad keeps on insisting that he should let John Marvin give him money. We should also note that just a month and a half earlier, Ellick's lawyers were claiming that Buster, who again has a full-time job, could not afford groceries. You'll notice in this next part that Buster seems reluctant to borrow money from his relatives and, and actually has plenty of money of his own. And when Ellick tells him he'll reimburse John Marvin for storage, if you listen really carefully, you can hear Buster start to say, 
Well, I don't understand how you would. Well, we need to get John to pay for the storage facility and then let me pay him back. Well, I don't, I don't understand not how you would. You need to be paying. But anyway, I mean, do you want me to get him to give you just, I don't know, four or $5,000 so you just have and you don't have to worry about expenses? No, because I've got that money. I've got, you know, I've got, I mean, right now my bank account, I've got $10,000. A little bit more when I get... sure, like, when you go play golf, you can, if you want to, get a shirt and have a drink and have drinks or whatever at the bar and this, that, and the other. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got stuff that can, that can settle all that. Alright. Well, you just gotta keep me posted because, you know, I can get him to give you money and then pay him back. Okay. Well, just, you gotta keep me posted and let me know, okay? Alright. Everything else going okay? Um, yeah, everything's fine. Next, we find out that the Mercedes with the run flat tires that gave away Ellick's lie about being shot is still at sled. Here, Buster seems to have to give his dad a dose of reality. You want to take my clubs? No, I, uh, no, I, I just use mine. I don't know where yours are. I think yours are still in the Mercedes. It's a sled. Shortly after they end the call, Ellick calls Buster back. He apparently forgot to ask him to do one of those end-of-call favors we told you about. Sorry to bug you again real quick. Um, hey, where's no Lily? Um, she's back at the house, which I just left. Okay, how about call her and tell her I'm trying to get her? Okay, what do you need from her? I need her to put some money on a canteen. All right. Actually, you know what? I'll call her again. I called her twice. No. Get... What? Oh, I'll... I'll... I can shoot her a bug, but just, I just got to do it while I'm right here at the, at the Exxon, because if I go any further, I'm not going to have any service. Well, she, there's a guy who doesn't get canteen, and canteen is the commerce. I know what it is. You know, I mean, it's, it's the commerce, it's the trade. And it really helped me last week when she put it on that Lucas's account, and I want her to do that one more time. Okay, it's just, outside looking in, looks a little weird. What do you mean? It just looks a little weird. Finally, someone points out the elephant in Alex's room. Finally, one of his family members points out his narcissistic shadiness. For a second, anyway. Narcissists are great at batting away reality. Just listen. Um, I, I, I get what you're saying, but I mean, I may deal with somebody, I give them $15. See, I can only do $60 on my account. I understand. I'm just saying, and I'm not saying you are, man. I just just really hope you're not in there doing anything you shouldn't be doing. Oh, no, I'm not doing anything. I promise you, that's not the case. All right, well, let me call her real quick and tell her to be on the lookout, and I would... Uh, do, do, you have a, do you have an idea of, like, time in there at all? Buster tells him to wait. The same day, Ellie calls Lizzie, John Marvin's wife, a few minutes later. Like the other calls, Ellie starts a conversation with hurried pleasantries, but quickly diverts his intention, which is to get money put on another inmate's account for his own use. They're leaving. I'm not going to bother you. You have some quiet time. But I need y'all to put, I need one more time y'all to put, um, canteen on Lucas, on Justin Lucas's account. Okay. What's going on? What? What, I mean, what's going on with... It allows me to get, get stuff that I need. We can only get $60. And he doesn't get canteen, so I give him some money in return for using his account. I gotcha. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. And keep track of it, Okay. Okay. All right. I will. How soon will you be able to do it? Um, um, give me, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes or so. Okay. All right. You sure you don't mind? Yeah, it's, it's all good. 
Justin Lucas, by the way, is a 31-year-old inmate at Richland County who is being held in lieu of $7,000 bond for a single assault and battery charge and a shoplifting charge. Since March 2013, Justin has been arrested more than 40 times in Colombia and charged with 60 crimes, most of them petty crimes like trespassing, public drunkenness, walking in the roadway, public disorderly conduct, and something called aggressive begging. Liz Murdoch allegedly forgets to put money on Justin's account, which by the way is against the jail's rules. Liz forgot, so Ellick calls John Marvin that evening to get him to get Liz to complete this very crucial task. Why Liz? Why can't John Marvin or even Buster put money on Justin's account? Great question. Hey John, is Lizzie nearby? She is. She, I talked to her earlier. She was going to put some money on that account for me and she didn't. Okay, well, what is it? This is, this is where she knows what to do. The boy's name is Justin Lucas. Okay. And what, what, what is it then? It's putting, it's putting money on, he doesn't get canteen, so I give him some of the money, and he orders canteen. So I, I'm having I to order thermals and all that. I, I'm having to order ibuprofen because I'm exercising, and my knee and my shoulder, and hell, ibuprofen's $15 on there to get a week's supply. I got you. So it gives me extra canteen. I got you. And he doesn't get one? No, he doesn't. He doesn't get any. So she put it on his account. We just did it one time. We did it last week, and I'm gonna do it one more time. Okay. But I need her to do it right now. All right. And what's the amount? Sixty dollars. Okay. And she's supposed to be keeping track of all this, so I can make sure and pay you back. Ten four. Well, I'll get her. She's putting the kids down right now. Putting Randolph down. For God's grace. How long do you think she'll be? Four or five minutes. Okay, because we have like, I don't know, we have like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Then they talk about Jim Griffin and Dick Harpootlian working hard, but John Marvin seems to question their efforts a little bit. All right, well, Jim and Dick are working hard, so. What are they, what are they working on? I mean, are, are all, have all the charges been brought forward up? See, that's what I don't know. I, I don't know that yet. I don't know. I suspect that if they do it like they've done everything else, they'll sit and wait till something else comes up and then do some more charges. Right. But I don't know. I okay. don't know. Did you, have you talked to Randy since last week? Yeah, I talked to him. Um, I talked to him yesterday. And then John Marvin breaks some news to Alec. Apparently, Alec has not been reading Fitz news from jail. Yeah, you know about the law firm, don't you? No. Yeah, the law firm is, has dissolved, and they're reforming under a new name. I didn't know nothing about that. What is that? Yes, because of all the negative publicity and all the stuff they're going through. What is the new name? Um, they operate under the... What? The law is... It's going to be offered under the Parker Law Group. The what? Parker Law Group. Sounds cool. And then I think each one of them kind of opens up an LLC partnership or LLP in each each partner's name and operates under the, the Parker Law Group heading. I hate they having to go through all that. Yeah, but they, they catch them. They go into all kinds of stuff. Is there anything I can help with? Nah, man. You know, I suspect when the time is right and the things that, that you acknowledge, uh, I think opening up about it to the general public. Because that's why there's a lot of people that just think that you kind of dump everything. On December 31st, Fitz News was first to report that PMPED had dissolved and that the firm's partners had each created their own legal entities. All of them are practicing under the umbrella of Parker Law Group, which is the last name of Johnny Parker, one of the most prominent members of PMPED. The other thing Alec apparently didn't know was that his friend and alleged co-conspirator, Corey Fleming, was no longer employed by his Beaufort law firm. When you're listening, 
Note how Alec asks whether Corey's firing is real. Either he finds this truly unbelievable, or he's rather accustomed to things being done just for the optics. You know, I mean, obviously Corey's been fired. I mean, you knew about that, did you? Been what? Corey has been fired. Legitimately he, for real, or just? I, I understand he's, they, they've removed the name from the law firm, removed the name from the sign out front, and he's not working. I knew he had some issues with license, but no, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's permanent or whether that's just a temporary deal, or I'm not, I, I don't know, but I, I suspect it's more permanent. John Marvin makes an attempt to appeal to Alec's moral sensibilities, which, best of luck to you, John Marvin. I just think that the, talk to Jim and Dick, and, and I think that, that you talking talking about certain things is going to come, you know, coming back and talking about it is going to make a difference. It's got to. I mean, that's the only thing that can make a difference, I think. What do you mean talking about what? You know, if you've been charged with something that you that you did, acknowledging and accepting it and, and making clear who didn't do anything. So but obviously, only the only if there's something. something. Oh, there's people saying that the law firm's done all kinds of stuff. There's, there's people saying, Alex, it's, it's amazing what's going on. They're saying that the law firm has done all kinds of stuff. They're saying that Corey, Chad, Russell, Chris. You name it, and, and everybody's implicated. Did you notice how there is no presumption of innocence on John Marvin's part? Alex's guilt appears to be a foregone conclusion, even by his own family. Now, this didn't come from law enforcement, to my knowledge. This is just one world street. I mean, I said, and there's been, there's been no talk whatsoever from anybody in an official capacity. So, you know, I, I just think it'll make a difference. It, it, well, when I talked to the court the other day, one of the things I said was, you know, my partners didn't know anything. And I said, Chris and Corey, you know? Yeah, know you know, I, 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 Did they I not bring any of that? No, I meant very little of that was said because they couldn't report it. John Marvin urges Alec to run the idea by Dick and Jim. There was some of it that was brought back out, but I don't know. That's what we're talking to Dick and Jim about the and see if, I don't even know if there's any way to give an official statement. Or, I don't know. That's not, they got to figure all that out of it. But they, they don't have the same issues that, that Randy and the firm and everybody else has. They don't what? They aren't having the same issues. Who is it? And it's more perception than anything in my, at this point. Who isn't having the same issues? Dick and Jim. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at it from a whole different perspective, you know. They're doing it from a, from a way that they, they manage it. That's, that's just what they do. They know how to manage what they're handling. I need to, I need to sit down with them and figure out what I can do, is what I need to do. Well, it'd be worth a conversation with them to find out, for sure. And it may not matter. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like that's about the only thing left that, you know, I just, and I just don't know the manner to do it. And you only do it if it's something that, that you did or, or, or need to say. I mean, obviously, if it's something that you weren't involved with, you can certainly say that. Sure, sure. All right. Thank you for letting me. Anyway, I'll get those right now. Then, for the first time in all of these calls, someone says the names Maggie and Paul. John Marvin talks about how the family recently shared a somber moment. Alec, ever the narcissist, asked if they were sad about him. Because of me or because of Maggie and Paul? Maggie and Paul. Maggie and Paul in particular. I know all about that. Alec then quickly changes the subject. It's now time for his end of call favor. All right, will you yeah. talk to Lizzie real, real uh, soon? Yeah, I mean, I'll do that right now. The, the dude just told me we got like two minutes, so she's got to do it. All right, I'll do it right now. Can she do it right okay. now? Yeah, I'll get her. Listen to this now, John Marvin. you got to remember this name. Justin Lucas. We filed more Freedom of Information Act requests for phone calls, and we have several great episodes in store for you. Stay tuned. The Murdoch Murders Podcast is created by me, Manny Matney, and my fiancé, David Moses. Our executive editor is Liz Farrell. Produced by Luna Shark Productions. 